All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our first session on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Uh, yet another uh, installation from the Mythgard Academy. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this. Of course, Douglas Adams has been on the list for a while. You know, we've had uh, we've had Hitchhiker's Guide as a as a finalist several times before, uh, and so I've been kind of preparing myself, thinking about the day when uh, when we will finally get to talk about this book. I came to this book fairly late in life. This is, of course, not one of those that I've never read before. Um, uh, I have read the Hitchhiker's Guide several times before, but I I I, I it was only goodness. Um, maybe 10 years ago or something like that, that I finally read it for the first day. It was forever. Uh, I, you know, so I'm coming to it, uh, super late. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I am, uh, I am, uh, I'm a fan, uh, of the, of, of the book. A couple things that I wanted to mention, uh, at the beginning of, okay. One sort of general disclaimer I want to give at the beginning. This book is a very funny book. And as a consequence, there can be a kind of awkwardness, actually, in talking about and doing the kind of close reading of it that I, you know, generally do to books that we talk about together. Um, and I, I just kind of want to uh, uh, sort of acknowledge the fact and, and to sort of make it clear that I'm aware of this fact. What I mean is, it's um, whenever you're looking at a f something that is funny and you're thinking about why it's funny, you cease to, you like, cease to be amused, right? I mean, it's, it, you kind of make it unfunny by kind of taking it apart and asking yourself where in the humor lies. Uh, and I, <clears throat> I don't, it's of course possible to do that in a really uh, distinctly sort of unfun way that I guess seems to try to uh, suck all the entertainment out of whatever it is that was funny in the first place. So I know that there's probably a bigger risk of that here with this book than with anything else that I've done before. And I know that there may be many times when some people, uh, you know, listening to me talk about this might be sort of kind of shaking their heads and saying like, OK, man, like you're kind of taking something uh, really seriously that is obviously and manifestly very unserious. Right. So like, isn't it just kind of funny? Isn't it just uh, you know, like it's just making a joke. Is it even appropriate to sort of, you know, think deeply about this and look for patterns that may or may not be there? So, you know, there are kind of a couple different issues there. One is the sucking the fun out of it by looking at what makes it fun. And then the other is, uh, again, taking, seeming to take seriously that which is sort of flippant and, and, uh, and not really designed necessarily to stand up to that kind of close examination. So I, I understand, like, I acknowledge the risk of both of these things in uh, in undertaking this discussion, um, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. I just want to acknowledge that that, you know, just kind of put it on the table, make sure you know that I'm aware that, that, those, uh, that those things exist. Because I do actually, you know, I have to say, I... Uh, at first, my very first reaction when I was thinking about, you know, again, this happened way back the first time it was nominated or the first time it was a finalist, rather. Um, my first thought was like, OK, I really am not sure what I would say about this because it's funny, but I don't want to just kind of go through and be like, ha, huh, isn't that funny? Hey, look, oh, there's another funny line, right? I wasn't really quite sure exactly what I would do with it, you know, in kind of Mythgard Academy style. Um, the thing that really made a huge difference uh, for me, really, was actually going back and listening to the original radio broadcast. Um, th we're going to talk about that. I do have a, a session set aside. I'm going to do it at the end after we after we uh, we read through the book. Um, so, because I do want to talk about the original radio broadcast, but I went back and listened just recently to the radio broadcast after it was nominated this past time, and uh, and that really like completely changed my world actually when I listened to the radio broadcast and then from there went and reread the book after that I was like wow okay now I have a lot to talk about and it really kind of emphasized a whole bunch of things it really um kind of opened up the book to me in a really interesting and different kind of way um and I We'll try to sort of express that a little bit more when we get to talking about the radio stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But the thing is, um, the primary thing that it emphasized for me 
uh, listening to the radio broadcasts and uh, comparing and contrasting that with the ultimate book. Um, because, of course, for those of you who don't know, the radio broadcasts came first. It was first a serial radio broadcast on the BBC, uh, and then the book came afterwards. And uh, if, in my mind, I had been uh, kind of tempted to think of The Hitchhiker's Guide as chiefly like a, a string of one-liners, right? Well, I listened to the radio broadcast, and I'm like, okay, the radio broadcast kind of is a string of one-liners, right? And so going from there to the book uh, really emphasized... Uh, basically what he had done, how he sort of took the one-liners. And it's funny because they're almost all there. I mean, almost every single one of the funniest lines in the book was originally in the radio broadcast. So like all of the humor, all of the jokes were there. The original radio broadcast is like all joke. And the, but then the book sort of takes those jokes uh, and preserves, again, almost all of them. Uh, there's very little that is in the radio broadcast that is not in the book. Um, it's just that the book has a lot more in addition to that. And it's the more in addition that uh, really uh, struck me uh, so forcefully when I went back and, and reread the book after listening to the radio broadcast. And so that's what I really want to um, that's what I really want to emphasize. I, 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 so to me, the, the main theme uh, for today, of course, that, uh, you know, what a slice of lemon and a gold brick uh, have in common. Well, they have a number of things in common, right? Uh, that is, they don't float up in the sky uh, and they're yellow um, uh, as well, of course, as uh, their uh, similarity to a pangalactic gargle blaster in tandem. Um, however... Uh, it's the the uh, the main thing I want to emphasize today. The main thing I want to do, looking at the way that this book opens and sort of what it does to us as readers, or what it sort of asks us to do as readers, um, I found really fascinating. Anytime you're reading a work of science fiction or fantasy, there's always that step at the very beginning, right? And we've talked about this before when we've. Uh, when we've looked at other works. I remember talking about this when we talked about en Ender's Game a long, long time ago. I remember talking about this when we talked about Dune and when we talked about um, uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, right? I mean, uh, all of the, you know, whenever we're kind of entering into this new sort of science fiction or fantasy world, there's always this question of orientation, right? How is it that... Um, how is it that we are introduced? How are we being asked to think? What kind of cues are we being given about the world that we are being asked to enter imaginatively, right? What kind of context are we given? Um, so I want to focus on that. We're going to talk about um, uh, chapters one, two, and three today, and uh, as well as the sort of prefatory uh, material as well. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. And, and Sharon, you're right. The changes uh, from the uh, from the radio to the book to movie uh, are made. Uh, boldly and without concern for diehard fans nitpicking. That is certainly true. Um, the, the shift from the radio to the, uh, to the, to the book was, is, is certainly very striking. Um, but anyway, so, um, uh, what was I just going to say? Oh yeah. Orientation, right? So how are we, what is this asking us to do? And my argument, again, the reason I have evoked the slice of lemon and the gold brick in the title of my uh, of my session here tonight, is that I think that that sort of the the experience of drinking a pangalactic gargle blaster uh, seems to me a sort of metaphor uh, for the experience at the beginning of this book um, that the readers have to some extent, but to a much greater extent, of course the characters and especially Arthur Dent have, but, um, let me stop talking about what I'm going to be talking about and just start talking about it. So let us move on. Very opening paragraphs of the book. Far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the Western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 98 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape-descended light forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. Now, what does these first two paragraphs ask of us to do? I want, I, want, I want to hear you make some observations here. What are some things that you notice about this? What strikes you? Again, what is the context that we are being given 
Um, how are we being introduced to a the our world, right, and b sort of the overall perspective or point of view um, of uh, of the story? Um, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, Brian, we, we do get the emphasis on the insignificance and ridiculousness of our world. Those seem to be two uh, clear themes there, right? Um, I agree. Neil says a uh, uh, view from from outside, right? That we're given an outsider view. Um, this is not a... This is an introduction to the Earth which seems to... Um, which seems deliberately... Uh, to avoid any kind of prejudice in favor of the world, right? Um, this is an ultimately non-geocentric description of our planet, right? Um, and very much diminished in importance, Kate. Of course, any any kind of uh, uh, any kind of predisposition we might have, right, in favor of the Earth or thinking of it as being in some way significant, uh, it is certainly. It is certainly not. Um, James, yeah, James Stevens points out that Earthlings are like children to the rest of the universe. Um, you know, yes, the, the fact that we are far, like, basically we barely, we barely even count. Humans barely even count as intelligent life, right? Um, the human race is introduced and uh, characterized as being so amazingly primitive, right? We have to, uh, we have to sort of reach for an illustration that sort of can demonstrate how amazingly primitive uh, we are. The digital watches thing, of course, though, links it to the present, or at least to Adams's present. Um, that is to say, this makes it clear we're not talking about like you know the world a, a while back, right? It is our present day world, which is the amazingly primitive. Uh, unfashionable, uh, you know, backwater uh, living place. Um, unregarded, I agree, Sharon, is a, is a significant adjective. Um, lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. Um, it doesn't, that's... Notice that that doesn't make any objective claims about the sun. Like, uh, to say unimportant, for instance, that's an objective claim, right? To say, that, and of course the 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 our yellow sun is not important i mean other than to us um it's you know from a from an uh, an astronomical standpoint our sun is extremely generic right um but the thing that interests me about that is the about sharon as you point out the word unregarded that's a relative term right unregarded by other people right that is to say it's not just the message for us in these first two paragraphs is not just, okay, orient yourself to the fact that we don't matter very much and we're fairly primitive, but it also acknowledges a sort of a broader galactic society that uh, we, of, of which we are unaware, right? Uh, and again, see, Sharon, this is where I think is why I really appreciate the emphasis on the word unregarded, right? Because to be unregarded involves a sort of a climate of opinion which is not regarding it, right? There's there's this sense of this larger society out there who just doesn't pay any attention to us. Now, that doesn't necessarily prove that we're not important, right, or that our son isn't important. It just means that nobody really cares or pays attention to it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, and good, yeah, Stephen, Uncharted is interesting, too, Right, uh, in a similar, we are in the backwaters of the unfashionable end of the Western spiral arm, right? So, the the backwaters in which our our sun uh, uh, exists is so unfashionable that no one's even bothered to chart it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Joyce, I agree. Uh, Joyce says we have a, a semi-anthropology mixed with a strong flavor of tourist guide. There is that tone as well, right? That sort of tourist guide uh, uh, um, uh, tone. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, and uh, Kate, really great uh, 
great observation, Kate points out that, of course, each of the first two paragraphs of the book here are each only one sentence long, right? We are, we, it's, it's another thing that we can see, right, kind of stepping back, but is that where uh, uh, Adam seems to go in for long sentences, right? Um, and uh, that's... Um, that I think is fairly, is fairly, is fairly typical. Kate, one of the main things that I see about that is the pattern of that second sentence, the longer of the two, seems to me that's very Adam. Uh, it's very what? What would be the adjectival for it? The the adjectival form. Uh, ad ad adamsian. Ad, ad adamsic. Ad, uh, Adamsish. Uh, Adams, well, I'm not such, I'm not such a big fan of esque, Neil, because esque suggests that it's just kind of like it, right? Uh, Adams-ish, Adamistic, <laughs> Adams-tastic says Boomful. I like that, Adams-tastic. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Twitter poll time says Karina. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no time. Um, I think. Uh, well, okay. Well, so the the problem is, Adamsian. That looks right when you write it down, but it doesn't sound right when you say it. Right? I can't. I can't go around saying Adamsian. Right. Uh, like you can't put the stress there. That just that just it's not right. But he can't say like Adamsian either. That also doesn't work. So that's clearly the logical adjectival form, but just it it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't roll. Like it can't um, Adamsian. Ah, no, it just doesn't. Uh, it's, ah, you can't dance to that. Um, Adams-ish. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with Adam's ish, uh, mostly because it's slightly comical, which seems right, right? I mean, you, you don't want to, you, you wouldn't want to invent an adjective for that, which takes itself too seriously, right? So I'm going to go with Adam's ish. I think that's, uh, uh, th I think that's, um, yep, that's the way to go. Adam's ish. Okay. The, but what I was trying to say is that the syntactical structure of that second sentence is is very Adam's ish, right? Um, we get this sort of establishing a tone first, this sort of science-ish, faxy tone, right? Orbiting, orbiting this at a distance of roughly 98 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet. So we have a uh, string of adjectives, also very uh, Adams-ish. Uh, whose ape-descended light forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea, right? The tonal sh that that was so all of this rolling out to one final joke at the end, uh, with that joke coinciding with that shift in diction as well, right? I mean, you contrast pretty neat idea with. Um, uh, you know, at a distance of roughly 98 million miles, or even utterly insignificant uh, planet. Um, that's uh, uh, again. That that's that's very uh, that's very. I was going to say standard, but that's not right. Very typical. Very typical of of uh, of this of his show. Now, oh, Karita, thank you. That's another major issue that I meant to bring up at the beginning, but I forgot. Thanks, Karita, for reminding me about that. Uh, I feel inadequate reading Adams in an American accent because it's pretty British and there are some bits of it that just don't work. They're just not as funny in an American accent. But I'm not going to insult uh, the English by attempting to fake an English accent myself, which I do quite badly. Uh, so I'm kind of stuck. So I, again, I'm just kind of acknowledging the problem at the beginning and then, uh, and then uh, plowing along. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, but so yeah, it just try to try to like in your head. You should certainly. Be, uh, by, so by the way, I strongly recommend 
Uh, I mean, as you guys know, I'm a huge audiobook person anyway, but the unabridged audiobook of this is read by Stephen Fry fantastically. I love Stephen Fry's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, really, really, really good. Uh, so that's... Uh, though, the kind of the, the funniest... Um, um, the funniest... Uh, uh, element actually of going back and listening I hadn't listened to it in years and in the years since I had last listened to the Stephen Fry Hitchhiker's Guide uh, I had I had been listening to the Stephen Fry um, Harry Potter because uh, I have the, the, the Stephen Fry unabridged Harry Potter recordings um, that I was listening to with my kids um, so like I'm now listening to Hitchhiker's Guide and I'm hearing like Harry Potter characters it was really it was really funny. Like uh, Ford Prefect sounds kind of like Bill Weasley, uh, for, for instance. It was kind of messing me up. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was fantastic. And yes, Neil, the Stephen Fry Harry Potter readings are so much better than the Jim Dale. It's like not you, you. You can't go back. Like once you've heard Stephen Fry's Harry Potter, you can't possibly go back. It's physically painful to return to Jim Dale uh, after, uh, uh, after, after listening to that. Uh, so anyway, um, now Lance, thank you for mentioning that. I wanted to, uh, I, I was going to, I was going to bring that up, but we moved past it and then I forgot about it. Um, Lance Crimmins asks, how can there be a Western spiral arm of the galaxy? Right. It's a spinning galaxy in three dimensional space. And what's it West of what? Like, what is the, what is the North? Right. Uh, who 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 decides the cardinal points of the galaxy? Um, I think um, I think that that's uh, actually a really, really interesting point, because, again, you notice. Here's why I think that's an important point. Who's the joke on here? Right. Um, to some extent, obviously, the first of when we, when we read through these, the jokes sort of on us, right? On earthlings in general. Um, and there's, and the, the, the speaker, the narrator of the book is making fun of us. Right. So there's an, there's a, there's an us and us and them, right? There's an us and him, right? With a narrator. Um, the narrator is not speaking from an earthly point of view. And if we make pro earth or, or geocentric assumptions, the jokes on us, Right. Uh, and if we think that we modern folks have moved beyond being amazingly primitive, we get the joke um, uh, uh, sprung on us there at the end of the second paragraph. But it's not that simple. Right. There's all the joke is also on. Um, I think that the, the the joke is also on the narrator as well, um, that I think the narrator is not meant to be taken completely seriously. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny, some of you are talking about how uh, some astrophysicists some astrophysicists will talk about cardinal points, about, you know, defining north and to, in, in, as far as the galaxy is concerned. To which I would say, and what do you think Ford Prefect would say to those astrophysicists, Right. Again, I think it's part of the joke. Um, uh, but um, anyway, uh, and am I crazy or is that number wrong? 98 million miles, is that right? Is his facts correct? Anyway. Yeah, I thought that was wrong. David is confirming that it's wrong. Yeah, I thought that that was wrong. Um, again, this is this is my point. That is to say, one of the joke, the first joke, right? The sort of the first level joke, is if we come in with like pro Earth, uh, uh, geocentric and uh, uh, anthropos and anthropocentric assumptions, the joke's on us, right? But again, I am not sure that the joke isn't also on the narrator, uh, to some extent, right? Um, 
See, Drew, it does say roughly, but then it says 98 million, right? If it were really being rough, it would just say roughly 100 million, right? It says roughly, but then it gives a very precise, I mean, not very precise. I mean, it doesn't say like 98,476,000 or something like that, right? Um, but still, like if it were just waving its hands at the distance, uh, surely it could be more rough than 100. Um uh, but, uh, yeah, so it's close, but it isn't exactly, it isn't exactly right. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, let's keep going. So where do we go after this? This planet has, or rather had, a problem, which was this. Most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty much of the time. Many solutions were suggested for this problem, but most of these were largely concerned with the movements of small green pieces of paper, which is odd, because on the whole it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. And so the problem remained. Lots of the people were mean, and most of them were miserable, even the ones with digital watches. Many were increasingly of the opinion that they'd all made a big mistake in coming down from the trees in the first place, and some said that even the trees had been a bad move, and, no, and that no one should, have, should ever have left the oceans. Um, go, oh, good, yeah, several of you, as I was reading, were commenting uh, that um, the information, most likely, for those first couple paragraphs is presumably, probably taken from the guide, right? Um, which, of course, we're told, and we'll look at that in just a minute, um, we're told is often wildly inaccurate, right? But again, that's my point, right? Um, if we have, you know, if uh, having taken the first joke, right, the joke on us, that we're not all that we think we are and we're not all that important or interesting or uh, uh, or even evolved, right? If we take that joke first, that the, the sort of one of the assumptions upon which that joke seems to rest is that the 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 larger framework from which we're being addressed in that in those first couple paragraphs is objective in some sense, right? Um, that compared with the perspective of the narrator, we are small, parochial, unimportant, right? But that too, there's there's jokes on it also. Right. Um, yeah, and Jennifer, I too love the, or rather had a problem, right? In paragraph, s several of you were uh, teasing me. I, last night in uh, my Exploring the Lord of the Rings class, I was, I was uh, plugging this class and inviting people to join me and uh, mentioned that I, we were going to cover the destruction of the earth. And um, uh, that's, um, it, it, then people were yelling at me for giving away spoilers, but that's the joke, right? I mean, the beginning of paragraph three point gives it away, right? Um, the fact that the, 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 the problems of the earth are put in the past tense and not, it doesn't just drop it. Right. I mean, it does drop it, but it's, I mean, if it, if it only said this planet had a problem, which was this, right. That would be one thing. Um, it could suggest merely that the problem of the planet had been solved. Right. Uh, which is still a possible reading of this sentence, but the interjection, this planet has, or rather had, a problem, makes it come across completely differently, right? I don't, that doesn't sound like it's referring to the solution of the problem, but rather to the fact that the problem has gone away because so has the planet. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, hang on a second. One of the folks on Twitch, uh, to write, your copy of the book says 92 million miles? You actually have, like, are, are there editions of the book where the number was corrected? That's horrible. I hope that's not so. Hang on. This is my, this is my copy. It's an old copy. Uh, it's an old copy. It was my wife's who read this book decades before I did. Uh, no, no, this one has 98 million miles, too. Um, my text on the slides is drawn from the, uh, from the, the iBooks version. Anyway, okay. Um, uh, 
it gets pretty heavy here, right? Having just sort of made fun of us, it now acknowledges that this planet has a serious problem. And the serious problem is pretty serious. Most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty much of the time, right? Now notice again, we get that sort of register shift. Pretty much of the time sounds kind of like pretty neat idea, right? Um, it's not in that sort of, you know, sort of uh, uh, encyclopedic pretentious tone, uh, uh, but, uh, but the, the, the much more sort of colloquial tone. But still, um, the, you know, then we go, go back to patronizing, right? Uh, the, you know, many people have suggested problems with this, but then the patronizing stuff about money, right, which um, uh, is being made light of, right? Um, and so the problem remained. Lots of the people were mean, and most of them were miserable, even the ones with digital watches. <laughs> Um, huh, Lance, yours, your copy is the ultimate version and it says 92. This is from the digital version of the ultimate version and it said 98. Didn't it say, now I'm like doubting, what did I actually have on that slide? Yeah, no, no, mine, it said 98. Anyway, um, lots of the people were mean and most of them were miserable, even the ones with digital watches. Um, How, um, what's the problem? How would you characterize this problem if you had to think of a way to say what is the problem with the world or how can we understand the problem with the earth? Sorry. D David Atwee points out, he says, point of interest, 92 million miles is also wrong. <laughs> yes, tr true enough. True enough. Um, yeah, we do have... Um, we do have the, uh, the uh, a fairly radical solution to the world's problems here, right? Uh... How we often talk about this kind of problem, it's a big problem, right? A problem that most people are unhappy for pretty much of the time. Um, lots of people are mean. Most of them are miserable. Um, it's just kind of, you know... Life, right? Like life, the universe, and everything. Right? It's just kind of the problem with the people on the earth. Um, and they're beginning to question uh, whether or not, um, don't talk to me about life, says James Stevens. <laughs> yes, very good. Um, See, Lance, that's a really interesting point. Lance Alexander says, uh, uh, apparently the main problem is that most people were unhappy. So the rest of the universe is, is happy most of the time, or at least more than they are unhappy, right? So is, is this makes Earth different from everywhere else, right? Lance, that's a great question, right? The way in which we're being asked to look at the Earth objectively, you know, from a galactic point of view here... Um, Remember, we're around an unregarded sun in an insignificant uh, backwater, right? Um, this is what's wrong with us, right? Um, yeah, Veronica says, the, the narrator must come from a planetary society where material concerns are not important. You'd get that impression, wouldn't you? Right. Especially the the extremely patronizing tones, the word I keep coming back to about the about the money. Right. Um, and how strange it is to think that money could be part of a solution to this problem. Right. 
So we would expect, Veronica, as you say, that outside of the world, where obviously we have this like weird fixation, not only with digital watches, but with money, uh, outside the our world, things are going to be different, right? It's not going to be like that. We're It's part of being a weird backwater like we are, right? Um, except that's not really true, as we will come to see. Um, we will... Uh, we will come back to we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. So, how could our problems be solved? Well, hang on a second. Unexpectedly, we get a possible solution, right? And then one Thursday, nearly two thousand years after one man had been nailed to a tree for saying how great it would be to be nice to people for a change, a girl sitting on her own in a small cafe in Rickmansworth suddenly realized what it was that had been going wrong all this time, and she finally knew how the world could be made a good and happy place. This time it was right, it would work, and no one would have to get nailed to anything. Sadly, however, before she could get to a phone to tell anyone, anyone about it, a terrible, stupid catastrophe occurred, and the idea was lost forever. But this is, not, this is not her story. But it is the story of that terrible, stupid catastrophe and some of its consequences. Ah, good. James is pointing out we get the roughly again. Uh, or is it nearly 2,000 years? Roughly 2,000 years, right? Sure. Um, this terrible... Stupid catastrophe. Um, the setup for this, right? First, we are invited to think the Earth a small thing. Then we characterize the very serious problems of the Earth, right? Almost, you know, most people being happy, pretty unhappy pretty much of the time. Um, most of the people are miserable. And then we have what seems to be the premise of a quite remarkable story, Right? That one day in a small cafe in Rickmansworth, uh, a girl sitting by herself came up with the solution. Right? She came up with the solution to all of the problems. Right? Um, it's like the solution to the problem of life, the universe, and everything that she came up with. Right? And she was just about to go and tell somebody about it when a catastrophe occurred. Obviously, this sounds like the setup of talking about this girl and her solution and how that so solution might get worked out, right? If all we had were those first paragraphs, I mean, it's because that's what you tell stories about, right? You tell stories about remarkable, remarkable things. Um, and uh, this is a very remarkable thing, right? And yet he sets up that expectation and then immediately dumps it. Um, this is not her story, right? We're not going to, we're never going to learn the name of uh, the girl who came up with the solution uh, to human unhappiness, right? Um, this has all been a very roundabout way to introduce the terrible, stupid catastrophe and some of its consequences, right? Um, Tara points out that, like Tolkien, she hints at, he hints at a larger story that we don't get to hear, right? And that's true. Um, uh, that's true. Though here, it's played as a joke, right? It's not just to tantalize us. Um, in fact, the, the way that this gets dropped doesn't lead me to think that we're supposed to be wondering what the answer, what her answer was. Um it's, we're just sort of focused on the, the comic irony of leaving that behind, right? This thing which could be the most significant discovery in human history, but that's not what this story is about, right? This story is about something else. Um, it is like the opposite of you, catastrophe. It's just, a, it's just a catastrophe. It's a terrible, stupid catastrophe. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and good, Stephen, it's not just a story that isn't told. It's a story that is absolutely ended before it can be told. I think that that's, I think that that's, uh, that that's very right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And good, Brandon points out that the, the reference to the terrible, stupid catastrophe doesn't lead a first re, lead a first time reader to know how big the stupid catastrophe is. Um, uh, yeah, Brandon, you're right. She could be like Edith Keeler from that Star Trek episode we talked about um, uh, in uh, uh, during the the webathon a couple weeks back, right? Um, that is a terrible, stupid. I mean, goodness knows, like her getting hit by a car on the way to a phone, right, in order to tell everybody, you know, in order to tell somebody, right, her solution to all of the world's problems would have been a terrible, stupid catastrophe, right? Um, you're right that we can't necessarily guess. It's our second hint, right, that we have about what's coming for the Earth, but um, um, but it's still not a very clear hint, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> Rachel says, would even have getting to a phone helped with this catastrophe? Oh, well, again, not when we know what the catastrophe is, right? Um, that even it, it, it wouldn't have uh, um, it it wouldn't have mattered if she had called someone, right? But again, we don't know that yet. Um, these are the introductions that we get to the world, right, and to this story. Uh, I want to look at how that plays out in the beginning, in the beginning, from the beginning of chapter one, when we join our actual characters in our actual story. But I want to pause for a second to look at some of the discussion about the Hitchhiker's Guide itself. Um, this, of course, is still from that introductory preface. In many of the more relaxed civilizations on the outer eastern rim of the galaxy, the Hitchhiker's Guide has already supplanted the Great Encyclopedia Galactica as the standard repository of all knowledge and wisdom. For though it has many omissions and contains much that is apocryphal, or at least wildly inaccurate, it scores over the older, more pedestrian work in two important respects. First, it is slightly cheaper, and second, it has the words Don't Panic inscribed in large friendly letters on its cover. Now, uh, first, the fact that we're talking about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has to be mentioned, right? The, the invitation that the title of this book uh um, gives us to um, identify the encyclopedia, the, the the histories, the Hitchhiker's Guide with the book that we're you know that like the the intimacy of the connection between the book that we are reading and this other very remarkable book that he's talking about, um, at the very least enables him to play some kind of fun jokes, right? That is to say. Um, he can talk about, like, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that wholly remarkable book, right? Which sounds like a puff of the book that he's currently writing, except, of course, it isn't, right? Um, and he couldn't possibly be uh, convicted uh, for that. Um, but um, uh, anyway, nevertheless, it allows for some fairly fun uh, sort of play with that. But it's hard to keep from aligning or at least kind of confusing the things that are said about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with the book that we're reading. And so, I mean, some of the questions that you guys were asking, uh, that a couple of you were asking at the, be at the beginning, like, are the facts that are being given in those first couple paragraphs, are they drawn from The Hitchhiker's Guide, is, you know, like, the the who is the narrator? You know, is the narrator The Hitchhiker's Guide or, you know, a writer, it's Ford Prefect or someone similar, right? Um is this whole story being told essentially from like a hitchhiker's guide kind of perspective. Now we're never told the narrator isn't identified. Um, but again, it's all kind of uncertain and it's, it gives us, it becomes, uh, the only thing like a truly objective framework in this entire story, right? So lurking behind everything, all these questions we have about, like, okay, so the earth is, insignificant compared to the rest to other planets right well is that is that really true like sure we might you know have a, 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 a an inaccurately inflated opinion of the significance of our planet from our own point of view but does that mean it's actually insignificant I mean that's the other if we just go back for a second to that the first paragraph 
how much of this is objective? We talked about unregarded, which is explicitly non-objective, right? But what about unfashionable? What about uncharted, right? Unchar just well, isn't that down to the apathy and laziness of the people making the charts? Why didn't they bother to chart it, right? Um, backwater is backwater objective, right? Um, even small lies a small unregarded yellow symbol. Small compared to what? Um, that whole first again, so it, it, it gives this sense of object, but again, by whose standard, right? Um, I get the fact that we're being uh, sort of broken out of our own frame of reference, right? But whose frame of reference? Where does the frame of reference for the narrator come from? And the 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 thing that I keep coming back to, the the thing that we the narrator himself keeps returning to is the Hitchhiker's Guide, right? The Hitchhiker's, but of course it itself uh, has many omissions and contains much that is apocryphal or at least wildly inaccurate, right? So there's no claim uh, to objectivity, uh, to accuracy even, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, Brian wonders what exactly is a more relaxed civilization. That's also a really interesting question, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, is it comparing it? Brandon Minnick is wondering if it's, uh, uh, if relaxed uh, means compared to the mean and miserable people on Earth, right? Um in which case is more relaxed, that can't be being used as a, like with Earth as a standard for comparison, right? That would seem to undermine the whole point of the beginning of it. But again, compared to what? We aren't told, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Good. Um, oh. <laughs> Neil says, more relaxed than the Vogons. <laughs> yeah, but well, that seems safe, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Tom says, uh, uh, Tom McCarthy says, relax because they don't need accurate data. Uh, just comforting words, apparently. Yes, what, like, don't panic, right? Um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, here's the other thing that interests me, though, about this description. Um, the, the joke... <laughs> Again, think of the Adams-ish sentence structure here, right? Once again, that whole first paragraph is another extremely long sentence, right? Um, but look at how it winds up. It scores over the older, more pedestrian work in two important respects, right? So it introduces us to... So we're here to expect a list, right? A list of important things, right? Right? And the first respect in which it scores over uh, the older pedestrian work is that it's slightly cheaper, right? Now, again, that's funny. Um, though, of course, the, the, the two ways, the two things that we're given, like the two virtues that the Hitchhiker's Guide has that the Encyclopedia Galactica doesn't have is that A, it's slightly cheaper, and B, it has the words don't panic inscribed in large friendly letters on its cover. That's pretty much what separates the two of them, right? That's why it's better. It has don't panic on the cover and it's slightly cheaper. Um, here's the thing that interests me about, I mean, it's funny and I, I, I always laugh at first it is slightly cheaper, uh, but Notice how this moves in the opposite direction of the first paragraph of the book, right? That is to say, the first movement in the book is distance, right? To distance us from the earth, from our normal assumptions. What can we expect? What can we take for granted, right? Question the things that we take for granted 
our whole world is not that important. Our civilization is not all that, right? Because even when you look at it, everybody's mostly mean and miserable, right? So, um, again, so this first message is everything that we sort of take for granted, everything that we might sort of value, we can kind of get ready to throw that out the window. And then, what are we told? Uh, what are we told about the supremacy of the Hitchhiker's Guide? How do other people judge it? The fact that it's more popular than the Encyclopedia Galactica because it's slightly cheaper. Um, all of a sudden, we're back in a familiar world, right? One of the reasons I find that so funny is not just that it... It's not just the comic come down and Adams is just the master of the of like the setup and then the comic come down, right? Um, uh, writing a long, pretentious sounding sentence that ends with farce is just classic Douglas Adams. He's he's so good at that. Um, like the digital watches sentence back in the first slide. And in part, of course, that's one of the things that's happening here. But the thing which is so strange about it is that it's so familiar. I'm expecting something alien, something different. Like, what does it have that the uh, Encyclopedia Galactica doesn't have? And instead, the comparison is, well, mundane, right? It's that, that it costs less. And of course, um, you're right. That, you know, as, uh, as Drew was just pointing out, um, weren't we just making fun of money? Right? And the whole currency question and money being important. And now immediately we're being told that in the broader galaxy, apparently, uh, whatever, whether they use pieces of paper or not, and whether they're green or not, um, this whole concept of money, which has played such a large role in people's attempted solutions of the unhappiness problem, seems to be, in fact, galaxy wide. Right, such that the slight, and not just much cheaper, that's slightly is what makes it so funny, right? The fact that the Hitchhiker's Guide is slightly cheaper than the Encyclopedia Galactica uh, is one of the pillars of its popularity, right? Um, and that's funny, right? And yes, Kate, the, the, the large friendly letters on Don't Panic, right? So it's like, why is the encyclopedia... It, 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 we're, we're, we're set up to expect some kind of like content analysis of the two, right? Why is it that the Hitchhiker's Guide is superior to the Encyclopedia Galactica? And instead we're given an economic reason, right? Not really like a mercantile reason. And then we're given uh, an aesthetic reason? It's not just that it has the words don't panic, because it's not about the meaning, right? It's about the large friendliness of its, it's about its font, right? That's what makes it better. Um, and so, yes, Tom McCarthy, I agree. One of the conclusions of this uh, that, that I can't help but come to here is that a that aliens are just like normal folk, right? And that's what I mean by sort of moving in the opposite direction. That first movement of the opening paragraphs is to create distance between us and the world, right? And to expect different things, to question our assumptions. And now, when we talk about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the picture that we are immediately given is of people that are quite similar, Right, who think about things exactly the same way. If you're going to buy two reference books, you are in fact more likely to buy the one that's slightly cheaper, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah. And then of course we have, uh, um, we have the the second. But this is the Pangoactic Gargo Blaster here. This is of course jumping forward uh, a bit in, uh, what's it, chapter two, I think. The guide also tells you on which planets the best pangalactic gargle blasters are mixed, how much you can expect to pay for one, notice you're going to pay for it everywhere, uh, there's the money thing again, and what voluntary organizations exist to help you rehabilitate afterward. The guide even tells you how you can mix one yourself. 
Take the juice from one bottle of the old jank spirit, it says. Of course, we've already been introduced to the old jank spirit and taught the miner's song about the old jank spirit. Pour into it one measure of water from the seas of Santraginus V. Oh, that Santraginian seawater, it says. Oh, those Santraginian fish. Allow three cubes of Arcturan Megagin to melt into the, mis- into the mixture. It must be properly iced or the benzene is lost. Allow four liters of Phalian marsh gas to bubble through it, in memory of all those happy bikers who have died of pleasure in the marshes of Palea. Over the back of a silver spoon, float a measure of, of Quilactian hypermint extract, redolent of all the heady odors of the dark Quilactian zones, subtle, sweet, and mystic. Drop in the tooth of an Algolian sun tiger. Watch it dissolve, spreading the fires of the Algolian suns deep into the heart of the drink. Sprinkle Zam 4. Add an olive. Drink, but very carefully. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sells rather better than the Encyclopedia Galactica. Um... Yeah, Mike, I agree. One of the consequences of this... And yeah, Arthur, the add an olive at the end, right? Again, like, lofty and then farce, right? Yeah, that's 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 very Adams-ish right there. Um, but anyway, Mike, I was in the middle before. I was distracted by that. I was in the middle of agreeing with your comment. Um, the fact that we don't understand most of this does emphasize how clueless we Earth people are, right? Notice all the stuff that this takes for granted. Uh, And that's part of the whole joke, right? Everything in it. Um, We have no idea what any of these things are, right? There are very few even points of reference. Arcturus is one of the only points of reference that we get. We have... Santraginus 5? Who knows where Santraginus 5 is, right? Um, Phalian marsh gas? The marshes of Palea? Right? No clue. Um, what are the qu- Qualactin zones? Right? I mean, apparently they're subtle, sweet, and mystic. Or at least the, uh, the heady odors therein are subtle, sweet, and mystic. Um, Algol, sorry, Algol is another frame of reference. That's, of course, another uh, star name. Um, less, uh, uh, slightly, slightly less well-known than Arcturus, but um, I, yeah, we don't um, we don't have any idea about any one of these things. But look at the things that it is inviting us to imagine, right? One measure of water from the seas of Santraginus V If it were just a list, that would be one thing, right? But this is not just a list. Um, If it were... The the, the list would still manage to uh, provide that same sense of cluelessness, right? And of our own parochial existence, right? Um, What do you mean we've never even been to Alpha Centauri, right? Um, So if it just said, pour into it one measure of water from the seas of Santraginus V... Allow three cubes of Arcturian Megagin to melt into the mixture. Allow four liters of Thalian marsh gas to bubble through it. Right? If it just said those things, just the list, just the instructions, it would still create that sense. Um, the brilliant thing are the, are the additions, right? The commentaries that uh, are apparently included in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, that Santraginian seawater. Oh, those Santraginian fish. What is it about the Santraginian fish? Right? I have, it, it makes it more mysterious, right? But, oh, the the tone of it, right? Okay, so I guess I guess it's really good, right, in some way. Um, I don't know why it matters whether the benzene is lost or not. I, I mean, I guess it's important. I don't understand why, but, uh, but okay. Um, and goodness... The mar- I don't know where the marshes of Palea are, but they have suddenly this mythic significance, right? In memory of all those happy bikers who have died of pleasure in the marshes of Palea? Um, I have no idea, right? Um, 
Yeah, yeah. And so, Stephen, I agree. Even the mere fact that uh, the the writer of the guide is waxing poetic about these things uh, uh, gives us this impression, gives us this sort of tantalizing sense of how um, um, uh, of how uh, uh, I, you know wonderful all of these things are. Um, and yes, Yana, you're right. No need to wax poetic about the humble olive at the end, right? Which, of course, is the only... Unless there are other olives that grow elsewhere on other planets, that would seem to be the only uh, terrestrial inclusion, right? Um, and no, no poetry about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, though, Yana, you're right. The olive would be fairly exotic on Santraginus V, uh, for instance. Um, I, uh, I agree. Um, notice, though, how that last sentence works. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sells rather better than the Encyclopedia Galactica. Notice what isn't said. Notice what is assumed by the narrator here, right? All the narrator has done is to tell us about how... So, the passage right before uh, the slide where I began um, gives a, the... Uh, alcohol is referred to uh, in the... Uh, uh, Encyclopedia Galactica, right? Um, and it um, and it gives you know this like scientific description of what al where alcohol comes from and what it does, um, and then it's contrasting how alcohol is dealt with in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? That it would that it doesn't just tell you the scientific facts about alcohol, but that it tells you that the best drink in the galaxy is the Pangalactic Gargle Blaster, and that it also tells you, as we start here on this slide, and even gives you the instructions for how to mix one yourself. Um, but the thing that I find most interesting is the implied... Um, the implied connection in that last sentence. The, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy sells rather better than the Encyclopedia Galactica. It's the understatement there, right? Um, yeah, Josiah, exactly. It has, it has the Pangalactic Gargle Blaster recipe. QED, right? There can be no question about what is... Uh, about which sells better and why, right? But again, think of the assumptions that underlie that. Obviously, one that tells you which alcoholic drinks are the best and how to mix them yourself is obviously going to sell better than a book that just gives you a scientific description of alcohol. My point is not that I can't understand that, Right? that I can't get into the spirit of what the narrator is saying. My point is that in doing... It's, it's like it's too easy, right? Um, this is not an alien viewpoint. Why is it... Why would I necessarily assume that a book that was like this and gave all these things would sell better than the Encyclopedia Galactica, right? To say that assumes that it's... Yeah, you're right, Glenn. The, the encyclopedia sounds very dry in comparison. Um, I think Arthur would appreciate that observation. Um, but again, that, that is so, I guess, people around the rest of the galaxy don't like dry scientific books and do quite like alcohol and interesting mixed drinks, right? But that's not an assumption I would necessarily have made. Certainly not one that I would have felt safe making after the first two paragraphs of the book, right? Again, where distance, alien, assume, forget your assumptions, and now I'm being told to remember all of my assumptions. Do you see what I mean by that? Um, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yes, Mike, you're right. The, the writers of the Encyclopedia Galactica don't get invited to those sor- sor- sorts of parties. But that's just it, right? That apparently the readers, the galactic, you know, the galaxy-wide readers of the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, share the same general taste in parties that fun-loving Earth people do, right? Um... Yeah, yeah. Josiah and Lance are both suggesting that uh, you know it shows that there are more, there are more relaxed civil there are more relaxed civilization, but that's it. In other words, so it is when they say more relaxed, it is by our standards, right? Like we would identify them as relaxed, as well, right? Um, a lot of this seems to just be kind of stating the obvious, and maybe again, making heavy weather of something which seems really simple. But again, what I find so fascinating about the in, the introduction to this book is the way that it is asserting the two different things at the same time, right? Forget about the Earth. It's not all about the Earth. But, oh, actually, when you get outside the Earth, um, people are all pretty much the same, right? Oh, you Earth people are so... Uh, concerned about that currency thing that you have going on, right? But they're also going to choose the slightly cheaper book and be concerned to be told about how much you can expect to pay for a pangalactic gargle blaster, right? Um, it's, uh, it's all, it's all the same, right? Um, okay. When we get to chapter one, we have moments where, again, we're being given a particular... We're being asked to look at society from a particular vantage point, right? Um, Having been told that they want to build a bypass through Arthur Dent's house, the narrator says, bypasses are devices that allow some people to dash from point A to point B very fast, while other people dash from point B to point A very fast. People living at point C, being a point directly in between, are often given to wonder what's so great about point A that so many people from point B are so keen to get there, and what's so great about point B that so many people from point A are so keen to get there. They often wish that people would just once and for all work out where the hell they wanted to be. You hear the tone, right? Similar to those first few, few paragraphs. Similar to the condescending things said about currency, right? About the, the small green pieces of paper. Uh, this is, we're being invited to look at human society from an external standpoint, and an external standpoint which is inviting us in particular to find it all a bit silly, right? Um, I think about what uh, Mr. Prosser says about, by, of course, bypasses have to be built, right? Um why? Why do bypasses have to be built? Isn't this whole thing really kind of silly and pointless that we think this is really important? Um, again, asking us to step outside our normal assumptions and our normal way of looking at things and to acknowledge, you know, to recognize that seen from above, you know, seen from a galactic standpoint, it's all really kind of silly, right? Um, notice another example an even more interesting example uh, of a similar kind of thing. Uh, Mr. L. Prosser was, as they say, only human. In other words, he was a carbon-based bipedal life form descended from an ape. More specifically, he was 40, fat, and shabby, and worked for the local council. Curiously enough, though he didn't know it, he was also a direct male line descendant of Genghis Khan, though intervening generations and racial mixing had so juggled his genes that he had no discernible mongoloid characteristics, and the only vestiges left in Mr. L. Prosser of his mighty ancestry were a pronounced stoutness about the tum. <laughs> Does it say turn? Goodness, sorry, see this is me just copying and pasting from the uh from the ebook. That's really funny, about the tum. Is, it is clearly supposed to be. And a predilection for little fur hats. Um, uh, <laughs> Brandon and Arthur, I was thinking of Marie uh, as well. Uh, okay. Notice how this works. Again, once again, we have uh, that second sentence. I mean, like, or that third sentence, I guess. It's the one starting from curiously enough. Um, is another uh, classic 
Adam's ish turn, right? Uh, notice how it maintains that lofty tone, mostly maintains, right? Juggled his jeans, the tone wavers already there, right? Uh, the only vestiges left in Mr. L. Prosser of his mighty ancestry were a pronounced stoutness about the tum and a predilection for a little fur hats. Um, Interesting. Neil, it says turn in the first edition paperback. That's hysterical. It's obviously wrong. And it's not only obviously wrong because it's how, it's not how Stephen Fry says it, um, but uh, stoutness about the turn doesn't even make any sense. Uh, anyway, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, Yana, I think that must be a scanning error that was never corrected. Yeah, I think it must be. Anyway, um, but here's the point I, w- I want to make about this paragraph. Think about, um, think about the reader's perspective. Think about the relationship that we have with the characters in the story that we are listening to, right? We are being given privileged information, extremely privileged information, We're being told, who knows that Mr. L. Prosser was a direct male line descendant of Genghis Khan? Who knows that? No one knows that, right? There's no one on planet Earth who knows that Genghis... He doesn't know it. No one in his family knows it, right? We are told this from this objective narrator standpoint. And the effect of that is for us to have a different relationship with these characters, what they say and what they do than anyone else. We're told that Mr. Prosser is sort of a nervous individual. And we, the readers, are led to understand why he's so nervous, right? Because he keeps having all of these, like, dreams and stray thoughts, you know, about thousands of hairy horsemen uh, screaming, and he doesn't know why, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. The thing I'm trying to talk about is kind of a, a kind of abstract. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to come at this. Again, the point that I want to make is: where are we standing? From what perspective are we being invited to look at this whole story? Um, and the, pers- the point of view that this paragraph gives us is a very remarkable one. It's not, a, uh, it's not a, a human perspective. It's not even really a galactic perspective, right? Um, it's uh, a just... omniscient, right? Um, but it is... It's funny, I've got... Sorry, I'm being distracted by the fact that, like, 15 of you are, like, collating different texts to find which has Tom and which does not have Tom. <laughs> like, we, we, have a lot, we have a lot of very concerned textual critics here uh, uh, <laughs> in the class, which is great. That's very important. <laughs> but I'm getting very distracted by it. Uh, anyway, okay. Um, anyway. Do you see why I, I'm sort of fitting this into the whole perspective that we're given at the beginning of this story, right? Um, and the way in which I... F- the, the, the way in which sort of reading this book and paying attention to these things is is kind of like... Uh, getting smashed in the head with a gold brick. It's kind of like drinking a pan-galactic gargle blaster. Um, yes, Rob, I agree, I know. I was giving that one a pass earlier on, but now that we've come to the big tum issue, I can't possibly do so. That, yes, as you can see, my e-text also had bikers 
uh, in the marshes of Paleo, where I think it's very clearly hikers, actually. Uh, and many of the other texts have hikers there. So we have a hikers, bikers, textual error there as well. So there we are. Um, yes. Um, Jennifer, I think it's a really good way of saying it. We keep shifting perspectives, right? Close in one moment, galactic level the next. Um, lots of different points of view, right? Uh, you're right, even God's point of view, Jennifer. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it's inconsistent, but that in itself is, it seems to me, sort of part of the effect. Um, because remember, all of this, I'm doing all of this preamble stuff working up to the story of Arthur Dent, right? And the experience that Arthur Dent is about to have is kind of an Alice in Wonderland sort of experience, right? He is going to kind of go down the... Uh, uh, he's going to kind of go down the rabbit hole, right? And find himself in a completely strange place that does not work, it seems, by the same rules. And that's what I find really interesting about the beginning of the story. At eight o'clock on Thursday morning, Arthur didn't feel very good. He woke up, he woke up blearily, got up, wandered blearily ar around his room, opened a window, saw a bulldozer, found his slippers, and stomped off to the bathroom to wash. Toothpaste on the brush, so, scrub. Shaving mirror, pointing at the ceiling. He adjusted it. For a moment, it reflected a second bulldozer through the bathroom window. Properly adjusted, it reflected Arthur Dent's bristles. He shaved them off, washed, dried, and stomped off to the kitchen to find something pleasant to put in his mouth. Kettle, plug, fridge, milk, coffee, yawn. The word bulldozer wandered through his mind for a moment in search of something to connect with. The bulldozer outside the kitchen window was quite a big one. He stared at it. Yellow, he thought and stomped off back to his bedroom to get dressed. The description of Arthur's morning routine, right, um, told very much, now again, to talk about perspective here, this is very much from Arthur's point of view, and not only Arthur Dent's point of view, this is very much from Arthur Dent's hungover point of view, right? Uh, this, you know, kettle plug fridge, milk, coffee, right? This sort of string of images and sort of disjoined sense experiences that he is having, right? Um, and the only thing keeping him moving is his routine, toothpaste on the brush, so, right? Now, around this world, so he is in his very comfortable little world, right? Well, comfortable, more comfortable when he doesn't have a hangover, admittedly, but his very normal routine world, right, which is his house. But outside his house, there are large yellow somethings, right, uh, that are kind of closing in on him, though he doesn't yet really notice or think about it, right? Um, and yeah, so Glenn, exactly, he's so plugged into the morning routine, the bulldozer doesn't even register. He sees it twice. He's even looking at it, right? He's sitting there sort of staring at the bulldozer out the kitchen window, right? And his only response is yellow, and he stomps back off to his bedroom to get dressed. Um, it's easy to see. Of course, we don't even need the bright yellow Vogon constructor fleet to move in later on in chapter three, uh, in order for us to see Arthur Dent here as a, a, a sort of um, representative, right? As a sort of uh, synecdoche of humanity and his house of planet Earth, right? Um, that parallel will become more obvious, right, as we move forward. Um, but he... Um, um, yeah, and Kimber, you're right. The fact that it's Thursday is our only hint of uh, the of of uh, the connection to the day in which the uh, the stupid catastrophe uh, happened to the girl uh, who came up with the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, we have his obliviousness to the rest of the world, 
right? The fact that he is so uh, unconcerned with what's happening outside the walls of his house that even when it's bulldozers in his yard, it barely even registers on him, right? And again, that's like us and our being wrapped up in the affairs of our world, right? Um, Yes, and Josiah, it does seem, therefore, also uh, to suggest that the state of humanity is kind of like a person with a hangover, right? So yes, people being, uh, cause remember even, you know, Josiah, if we even go back to the description, right? Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Right. Lots of the people were mean and most of them were miserable, right? Um, lots of them were mean and most of them are miserable. Yeah, exactly. Humanity as a whole, are the people with the hangover. Um, the, as the story progresses, we get this disjunction in points of view dramatized within the story, right? We have Arthur Dent, and of course then we have Ford Prefect, uh, who brings us an entirely alien frame of reference, right? Arthur looked up and squinting into the sun was startled to see Ford Prefect standing above him. Ford, hello, how are you? Fine, said Ford. Look, are you busy? (laughs) I just love that line. Am I busy? exclaimed Arthur. He is, of course, lying in the mud in front of the bulldozer that is in the garden path of his house, right? Well, I've just got all these bulldozers and things to lie in front of because they'll knock my house down if I don't. But other than that, well, no, not especially. Why? They don't have sarcasm on Beetlejuice, and Ford Prefect often failed to notice it unless he was concentrating. He said, Good. Is there anywhere we can talk? What? said Arthur Dent. Um, the, this is the first of many examples of the very different point of view, right? The very different frame of reference that Ford Prefect is operating in, right? He not only is looking out the windows of the house, but he understands how that wider world outside of the house functions, right? And it means that his perspective is different. He doesn't, they don't have sarcasm on Beetlejuice, right? So he uh, doesn't, um, doesn't track with what our, what Arthur is, uh, is, is, is saying here. Um, but that itself, I, I agree, Brandon, that a lack of sarcasm is an interesting thing to draw out. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. But of course, the fact that he doesn't get sarcasm is one thing that shows that his perspective is different from Arthur's. But it's certainly not the biggest, right? If that he would seriously, and without sarcasm, right, as we're being told, ask, look, are you busy to somebody who is in really quite a dramatic situation, right? Uh, lying in the mud in front of his house to prevent a bulldozer from knocking down his house, the complete lack of curiosity um, of Ford Prefect as to what's going on, his utter lack of concern about his friend, about the situation, uh, uh, it shows he has an extremely um, different way of looking at things, right? Um we see the same kind of thing again, right, uh, in the pub. So they've been in the pub now for a little bit. At that moment, the dull sound of a rumbling crash from outside filtered through the low murmur of the pub, through the sound of the jukebox, through the sound of the man next to Ford hiccuping over the whiskey Ford had eventually bought him. Arthur choked on his beer, leaped to his feet. What's that? he yelped. Don't worry, said Ford. They haven't started yet. Thank God for that, said Arthur, and relaxed. It's probably just your house being knocked down, said Ford, (laughs) downing his last pint. Right. Um, See, here, um, they haven't started yet, is the key of this entire exchange. Don't worry, they haven't started yet. Right. Um, And obviously, right, they're referring to completely different things. Arthur, of course, is thinking only of his house. So Arthur's, you know, we had that sort of uh, 
you know, kind of metaphorical Arthur only thinking about what's uh, about what is inside his house, right, and ignoring everything outside it. And now we ha- here we have Arthur running around as if preserving his house from being knocked down is the most important thing in the world. And the fact is, it is, right? I mean, this is a really, this is significant. This is a thing which could serve another book for, like, an initial plot line, right? Hey, I mean, you know, it doesn't have quite the, the ring of, you know, the events of the Iliad or something, but you could write a heroic story on these lines. And again, even, like, the action in which the you know, bravely lying in the mud in front of the, you know, lying bodily in the mud to prevent the bulldozers from, from uh, wrecking his house to stand up to oppression and to, uh, and and, you know, all this stuff like that. You could, you could make a story out of that. Couldn't you? Right. Um, It seems like a big deal. Just kind of like how many of the things that happen here on planet earth seem to us like a big deal. Right. Um, And yet, uh, the F- uh, Ford's complete lack of comprehension, or his complete lack of caring about uh, this story, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, Veronica, of course, uh, you know, what is the loss of your house compared to annihilation? You know, and he, he tries to explain. Ford tries to explain, right? Why, let them have their fun. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, but Arthur can't understand it. Um, and yes, Mike, alcohol is still the universal constant. It is right again that see the, the two directions again, right? On the one hand, uh, Ford prefects way of looking at things is completely different because he's operating in a totally different frame of reference. But at the same time, his way of coping with things is just like we've seen many people cope with things, right? It's, to, you know, when he gets homesick, he lunges into a pub, right? Orders an enormous round of drinks uh, and, uh, uh, and and gets completely wasted, right? Like, that's not alien, actually. Um, but my... F- uh, I, I, here's back to Mr. Prosser. When Mr. when Ford is convincing Mr. Prosser uh, to lie down in front of the bulldozer in in Arthur's place, right? Uh, that if we're going to if we we just assume that he is going to be lying there all day, you don't actually need him there, do you? Right? Um, it's just in the in the middle of that conversation. Prosser was worried. He thought that one of them wasn't making a lot of sense. Um, and then, of course, uh, he. Ford has just assured them that they will, uh, uh, they would be happy to sub in for him later on in the day in exchange. Thank you very much, said Mr. Prosser, who no longer knew how to play this at all. Thank you very much. Yes, that's very kind. He frowned, then smiled, then tried to do both at once, failed, grasped hold of his fur hat, and rolled it fitfully round the top of his head. He could only assume that he had just won. So, continued Ford Prefect, if you would just like to come over here and lie down... What? said Mr. Prosser. Uh, And then, of course, he explains once more, lie down in the mud. As soon as Mr. Prosser realized that he was substantially the loser after all, it was as if a weight lifted itself off his shoulders. This was more like the world as he knew it. He sighed. In return for which, you will take Mr. Dent with you down to the pub? That's it, said Ford. That's it exactly. Mr. Prosser took a few nervous steps forward and stopped. Promise, he said. Mr. Prosser completely losing his frame of reference. Uh, it, this is the consequence of Ford Prefect coming in. Um, Mr. Prosser had already been having a bad day, right? He has a job. He's supposed to show up and do his job, and things weren't going according to plan in his job, right? But then Ford Prefect comes along, and... He knows that one of them isn't making a lot of sense, but he's not really sure who it is. That's, of course, playing off the earlier line about that, you know, someone had been shockingly incompetent, and he just hoped to God it wasn't him. Um, uh, Yeah, yeah. Um, The readiness 
with which Mr. Prosser, at least temporarily, adopts the assumptions that, uh, you know, that, or adro- adopts the premises that uh, Ford Prefect is feeding him here, right? Um, I feel like, you know, Arthur Dent is sort of given to us. He's like every man, right? He's like the, the representative Earth Man, as he will be called. Frequently, an Earth Man is what he will be uh, often referred to throughout the rest of the book. Um, he is Earth Man in the abstract, right? Um, which, again, is also was reminding me of Alice in Wonderland, right? Alice is uh, not extremely remarkable. She's not supposed to be extremely remarkable, right? She's uh, uh, She is like a typical little girl, and Arthur is just a typical guy who, uh, concerning whom there's nothing really very special, right? Ford Prefect has this totally different viewpoint, and then here's Mr. Prosser in the middle, right, who completely, he has, he's trying to smile and frown at the same time, right? He has no idea how to process what's going on. Um, Remember what I said about being pushed in two directions at once, right? Mr. Prosser thinks he has things understood, and I love where this comes around, right? He's really confused, and he thinks that he is... uh, He could only assume that he had just won, right? Okay, I'm not sure I understand, but I think I just won. When he finds out that he's supposed to go lie down in the mud in in front of the bulldozer, and become a probable mental health hazard for his union workers, um, then he realizes that he is substantially the loser after all, right? And it's as if a weight is lifted off his shoulders. This was more like the world as he knew it, right? Um, the irony of his acceptance of the thing which is completely illogical, right? The thing which is totally unlike the way... He, he was trying to do his job. This other guy was keeping him from doing his job, which was really annoying. And now he's taking the place of the person who is keeping him from doing his job and accepting it as sort of part of his job to do that, right? Um, is reassuring, right? Because, why? Because it's more like the world as he knew it, right? Uh, the fundamental reality for Mr. Prosser is that things just don't work out for him. You know, that uh, uh, that he's going to end up with the short end of the stick. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, exactly, Stephen. That's the, that's the, for him, that's the status quo. Um, Notice in part how this returns us back to the prologue again, right? Being miserable most of the time, right? Oh yeah, lying there in the mud uh, in front of my own bulldozers, that's the thing that sort of feels familiar. And you're right, uh, Tom, his wife, uh, doesn't even let him hang axes over the door, most likely. Um, Yeah, yeah. My favorite, though, is the conversation between Ford Prefect and the barman down at the pub. Six pints of bitter, said Ford Prefect to the barman of the horse and groom, and quickly, please, the world's about to end. And then the barman, whom we're told does not deserve this kind of treatment, said, Oh, yes, sir. Nice weather for it, and started pulling pints. He tried again. Going to watch the match this afternoon, then? Ford glanced round at him. No, no point, he said, and looked back out the window. What's that? Foregone conclusion, then, you reckon, sir? Said the, bar- said the barman. Arsenal without a chance? No, no, said Ford. It's just that the world's about to end. Oh, yes, sir. So you said, said the barman, looking over his glasses this time at Arthur. Lucky escape for Arsenal if it did. <laughs> I think that's my favorite line in that whole chapter. Lucky escape for Arsenal if it did. Ford looked back at him, genuinely surprised. No, not really, he said. He frowned. <laughs> what we have here is a failure to communicate. Um, uh, okay, so the joke here, right, 
rests in the fact that the barman is just trying to make conversation, right? And we see the barman trotting out his standard conversational gambits, right? And he's clearly not listening, right? Um, uh, he, first he talks about the weather, right? Then he talks about the football match. Um, and <laughs> even t- and, 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 and grasps onto the fact that it sounds for a moment as if Ford Prefect is uh, playing along, right? He thinks he has finally got a point of contact when Ford says that there's no point in watching the match this afternoon, right? Foregone conclusion, then, you reckon, right? Arsenal without a chance. So here he's trying to, he's trying to, to uh, move that conversation along, right? Uh, and then even when Ford responds again with, it's just that the world's about to end, right? So you said, lucky escape for Arsenal. If it did, he tries to bring it back and make it a football joke, right? We have the barman who, through his completely cookie cutter uh, uh, conversational topics, right? The weather and football. Um, Living in this world of routine, this world of, remember Arthur and his toothpaste, not noticing the bulldozers, right? Um, The barman is a lot like that, right? Um, He just, he's not even processed. Oh yes, sir, so you said, right? He acknowledges that he heard Ford Prefect say that the world was about to end a couple times already, right? Um, but he is the fact that he says lucky escape for Arsenal if it did um, shows he obviously is thinking it's just it's just a joke right um, yeah yeah um, and uh, but Glenn you're right he's clearly used to really distraught patrons right uh, uh, and, to, and 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 notice sort of the play here that like the world's about to end. Um, the fact that he makes that into a football joke show, I mean, like, it's actually a perfectly plausible <laughs> football joke, actually, right? Um, I mean, I'm sure there are many people who would think it was the end of the world, right, uh, if uh, uh, if Arsenal won or lost that football game, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, and Brian, exactly. We see Ford dispensing with the casual pleasantries of conversation, as you say, and actually trying to tell him something important. Remember what he said to Arthur? Why did they need to talk right now? Right? Why is he interrupting the dramatic scene of the lying down in front of the bulldozers dozers to keep him from, from uh, 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 knocking down his house? He says, because I, I, I have to tell you the most important thing you've ever heard in your life. And here he is, he's telling the same important thing to the barman, right? Um... Again, you have the this huge gap between what Ford is trying to do and what um, uh, and what the barman is understanding, right? What he's uh, what he's perceiving. Um, and then we get this moment where the barman suddenly does get it. The only one, right? He's the only one who gets it. Of all of the human beings that Ford Prefect is trying to interact with, um, it is only the barman that has this experience where he recognizes his own point of view has changed. His own perspective is shaken. Nobody else's perspective really gets shaken. Mr. Prosser comes close. But then when he realizes that he's substantially the loser, he feels like he's back on familiar ground, right? He suddenly shivered. He experienced a momentary sensation that he didn't understand because no one on Earth had ever experienced it before. In moments of great stress, every life form that exists gives out a tiny subliminal signal. This signal simply communicates an exact and almost pathetic sense of how far that being is from the place of his birth. On Earth, it is never possible to be farther than 16,000 miles from your birthplace, which really isn't very far, so such signals are too minute to be noticed. Ford Prefect was at this moment under great stress, and he was born 600 light-years away, in the near vicinity of Betelgeuse. The barman reeled for a moment, hit by a shocking, incomprehensible sense of distance. He didn't know what it meant, 
but he looked at Ford Prefect with a new sense of respect, almost awe. "'Are you serious, sir?' he said in a small whisper, which had the effect of silencing the pub. "'You think the world's going to end?' "'Yes,' said Ford. "'But this afternoon?' Ford had recovered himself. He was at his flippest. "'Yes,' he said gaily. "'In less than two minutes, I would estimate.' This is the only example that we get. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Mike Moore and Rob Henderson just pointed out that both of those numbers, too, 16,000 miles and a 642 point and 600 light years, are both also wrong. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. Um, uh, anyway. The barman is the only one whose frame of reference changes. And that's what happens, right? That's the effect of this communication of distance, right? His own terrestrial viewpoint, more than terrestrial viewpoint, right? Really the viewpoint just of, like, small talk in his own pub, right, um, is suddenly, you know, he's, he, he is real. He reels and is shocked, right? Um, at this incomprehensible sense of distance. He doesn't understand it. But suddenly he is the only person who gets jarred to recognize that his perspective was too small, right? Um, and that Ford Prefect is speaking from this different point of view. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Neil, you're right. In the, in the radio show... He says, uh, in one minute and 35 seconds. Uh, but of course, there he has the advantage of knowing exactly when, how long on the, in the audio track it's going to be until the end of the world comes. Um, but anyway. Um, <laughs> right. So, exactly, Tara, the estimate uh, uh, there is inaccurate. Again, um, given the way that this story begins, the story begins as an Earth story, and then we're introduced to Ford Prefect, right? And then we are introduced to the then the wider galaxy sort of comes in, right? Like Arthur Dent with his morning routine inside his house, and then the bigger question of the local council and what they're going to do to his house, the way in which his little small house has been marginalized, right? And how big of a deal, how much bigger of a deal that is. How this has jarred Arthur out of his normal complacency, right? You know, he's been going on with his life and his routine, and now to discover all of a sudden that the local council is going to tear down his house, right? That's a big deal. That's like, that's real. That's bigger than his normal life. And so now he's engaging with his bigger than he's, you know, putting his life on the line and he's part of this dramatic story, right? This is, this is a, but then of course it turns out that that's only really very a small thing and it doesn't really matter. Uh, and in fact, the whole earth is going to be destroyed. Um, we are like Arthur. We are like the barman, right? The way in which this story kind of breaks open our frames of reference uh, is very sort of systematic, right? Um, and then, of course, we get the encounter with the Vogons. It's difficult to say exactly what the people on the surface of the planet were doing now, because they didn't really know what they were doing themselves. None of it made a lot of sense. Running into houses, running out of houses, howling noiselessly at the noise. All round the world, city streets exploded with people. Cars skidded into each other as the noise fell on them and then rolled off like a tidal wave over hills and valleys, deserts and oceans, seeming to flatten everything it hit. Only one man stood and watched the sky, stood with terrible sadness in his eyes and rubber bungs in his ears. He knew exactly what was happening and had known ever since his sub ether his sub ether sensomatic had started winking in the dead of night beside his pillow and wakened him with a start. 
It was what he had waited for all these years, but when he had deciphered the signal pattern sitting alone in his small dark room, a coldness had gripped him and squeezed his heart. Of all the races in all of the galaxy who could have come and said a big hello to the planet Earth, he thought, didn't it just have to be the Vogons? First paragraph, right? We have panic across the entire world, right? We've now widened the narrative from Arthur to the controversy with the town council, right? And now panic all over the entire planet, right? And in the midst of it, the one man stood and watched the sky, right? Now, uh, as Ford Prefect's view of things, at least to some extent, has... So, like, basically the entire world has just had the same experience that the barman just had, right? This sense of dif- of, 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 of distance, uh, this sudden recognition, not only that they're not alone in the universe, right, but that everything is bigger and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and you know, everybody's panicking. Right. Um, Of all the races in all of the galaxy who could have come and said a big hello to the planet Earth, he thought, didn't it just have to be the Vogons? It's the tone there. Didn't it just have to be the Vogons? Doesn't it kind of remind you of Mr. Prosser, who feels comforted by the fact that he is substantially the loser? Of course, typical, right? This is just the kind of thing that he would expect. Of course, it has to be the Vogons. Um, Again, distance and similarity, right? The distance first, Ford Prefect, uh, everyone else is panicking, scurrying around. He is standing there and looking because he's the only one who's not surprised. Not only is he not surprised, but this image that we get of him in another one of these long sentences, right? It was what he had waited for all these years. This is the fulfillment of his wishes, right? Um, But then that coldness had gripped him and squeezed his heart. Ooh, Ben, what a wonderful observation that is. Didn't it just have to be the Vogons? Doesn't that sound like sarcasm? Right? Again, Ben, that's the point that I come back to. The point of similarity, right? It turns out... So, we're shown two things that move in two different directions. Again, right? On the one hand... Turns out that our little small world is a small and insignificant thing, right? And there's a much bigger galaxy, a much bigger story. It's just a tiny little part in a much bigger story, right? Just like what was going on inside Arthur's house turns out to be kind of insignificant, like his breakfast and his toothbrush, compared with the fact that his entire house is about to be torn down, right? And a bypass put through. Exactly. Right? The same experience happens with the Earth. And yet, we find that the story, the much bigger story that the Earth is a part of, is exactly the same story. Right? That's the joke. Uh, Is that things are no different. Right? Um, Things are no different at all. Um... Yeah, Stephen Cover says, at this point, he remembers that on his first reading, he was thinking of some sort of classic sci-fi alien invasion or something, like the Vogons were some malevolent race. Uh, and then, of course, what we get is something uh, quite different, right? Before the Earth passed away, it was going to be treated to the very ultimate in sound reproduction, the greatest public address system ever built. But there was no concert, no music, no fanfare, just a simple message. People of Earth, your attention, please, a voice said, and it was wonderful. Wonderful, perfect, quadraphonic sound with distortion levels so low as to make a brave man weep. 
This is Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz of the Galactic Hyperspace Planning Council, the voice continued. As you will no doubt be aware, the plans for development of the outlying regions of the galaxy require the building of a hyperspatial express route through your star system, and regrettably, your planet is one of those scheduled for demolition. The process will take slightly less than two of your Earth minutes. Thank you. The PA died away. Um... Yeah, exactly, Boomful. It turns out that they're much, much worse than a malevolent alien invasion. They're bureaucrats, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the joke about the PA system is the th one of the things that I find really... Uh, really interesting here, right? Before the Earth passed away, it was going to be treated to the very ultimate in sound reproduction. Distortion levels so low as to make a brave man weep, right? That is to say, on the one hand, the Vogons have achieved a level of technology which is so far beyond ours that it's incomprehensible, right? That, like, it's turning, like, they're, the, they're turning sheets of rusted sheet metal, right, uh, into perfect stereo equipment. So what we have been trying to achieve uh, in, uh, in sound reproduction, right, through all of our labors over many years, uh, it, it's, you know, it just, it, with all of these crude materials, it just blows it away, right? It's, it's amazing how advanced they are, right? And yet then what do we hear from them? The same exact exactly the same uh, tawdry, bureaucratic heartlessness that Mr. Prosser was giving to Arthur earlier in the day. Right? Um, yeah. Um, and, uh, Brian, I agree. This is for a society that still thinks that hi-fi stereo is, uh, uh, is, 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 is a pretty neat thing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, So we get humorous contrast, right? But again, it's a... What do we find outside the... When the greater galaxy outside our planet breaks in upon us, what do we find? Well, we don't know if they're miserable pretty much of the time, but uh, many of them are mean and most of them were miserable. We have some evidence about many of them being mean already, right? Um, yeah, and Brandon, I also love uh, prostetnik uh, is a wonderful word. Um, I, too, assume it's a title of some kind. Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't mean anything, but it tells you what prostetnik vogon jelts already tells you I think of as much as you need to know, right, about uh, about that character. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Energize the demolition beams. Light poured out of the hatchways. I don't know, said the voice on the PA. Apathetic, bloody planet. I've no sympathy at all. It cut off. By the way, that's one of the places you can't say in American. I've no sympathy at all, is clearly what he's saying there. There was a terrible, ghastly silence. There was a terrible, ghastly noise. There was a terrible, ghastly silence. The Vogon constructor fleet coasted away into the inky, starry void. I love the understatement of the description of the destruction of Earth, right? An event which you think would be a tolerably significant moment, right? We get no description of any kind, right? We just get the three repeated sentences. The, 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 the silence is terrible and ghastly first, and then the noise is terrible and ghastly, and then, of course, the silence afterwards is even more... Uh, uh, is even more ghastly and more terrible. Um, but the fact that the last thing we hear, right, the last words heard on the planet Earth are the words that the Vogon says when he accidentally leaves the PA system on for a couple seconds after he's done talking, right? It's like he doesn't remember that his mic is still hot. I don't know. Apathetic, bloody planet. I have no sympathy at all. 
right? Um, it's exactly, exactly like on Earth, exactly like uh, what Mr. Prosser might say, right? Um, in the next session, we will accompany the Vogon constructor fleet off into the inky, starry void, right? Uh, as we begin life in Wonderland, right? As we begin the experience uh, of seeing what things are like outside this, this has ceased in a fairly decisive and emphatic fashion to be an Earth story anymore, right? Uh, as we get the destruction of Earth here in Chapter 3. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, we will... Uh, it would be very interesting to trace. What do we get next? What kind of frame of reference are we going to be given next? Um, what happens with Arthur as he is adjusting? Um, what does that do for us? Um, what are we going to see with the narrator, Ford Prefect, and Arthur and their different points of view? How is this story working? Where are we going? What are we doing? What is this story about? Um, it's hard to understand the trajectory of a story which has the destruction of planet Earth at the end of chapter 3, right? Um, so, uh, and yes, yeah, several of you are teasing me about the fact that I got through all of my slides. I did get through all of my slides. See, I told you guys we're going to do the destruction of the Earth tonight. No problem. Um, all right, so next time, uh, next week, we will get to talk about Vogon poetry. Um, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to, as you can imagine. So join me next week for Vogon for the third worst poetry in the galaxy. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, and I will see you guys next time. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at Signum University.